what is this problem that we're trying to solve? And if somebody can't answer that, then, you know, what's the point of actually working on it? Hello, and welcome to Polyweb. I'm your host, Sara Randi Tortoli, and my guest today is Gianna Basto, co-founder and CEO of ProdPod and of Product Tank and Mind Product. In this wide-ranging conversation, we cover many topics, uh, from prioritizing what to build uh, to creating realistic roadmaps, uh, being outcome-driven as opposed to being feature-driven, and even how to build and engage with communities. You can't just go based on number of things that people have asked for, or how many people have asked for a particular feature. You've got to look at that in terms of the bigger picture, what you're trying to be, what you're trying to reach as a company, and you know really what direction that means you're going to take. So, Gianna, you often start conversation with the question, what problem are you trying to solve? And I wonder why start with this question in the first place? Uh, how is that useful? Yeah, I love that question. I've been using it for years and it's always been really handy. I mean, what I love is that it can either you know, start a conversation, get people talking about the real problems underneath something can help continue on a conversation so that people think a little bit deeper about what it is that they're doing or why they're suggesting a change to something. But also it can stop a conversation in its feet, right? It's basically the type of thing that you can say, you know, is this a problem that we're actually trying to solve? What is this problem that we're trying to solve? And if somebody can't answer that, then, you know, what's the point of actually working on it? So when I was a product manager, I had no problem starting with that question. What is the problem that we're trying to solve? came fairly easy. Now, however, and that I transition from product manager to be a founder and like evaluating different ideas, I find myself being driven more or get more excited by solutions than problems. I think solutions or features get a bad rap, right? I mean, ultimately, what is it that we're doing? Well, we're providing solutions to the problem. Right. And so you might be in a space where you actually intuitively understand the problem. And so you jump to solution. But then if you're asked that question about what problem does this solve, if it's solving the right problem, then it might be the right solution and it's worth trying. Right. It's okay to get excited over features and solutions. You know, these are the things that are tangible that you can say, oh, yeah, I can definitely see how this would work. As long as you don't fall in love with your solutions, you don't fall in love with your features, right? Be ready to kill it if it proves that it's not the right thing to do. You've got to be able to take it out to the market or to your early customers or to your teammates and take their feedback on board. But the solution is what we, 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 we hang on, right? This is the thing that's going to make the difference and it's the tangible piece. And so you could take that and say, hey, what about this? And that's the basis where you start asking questions to figure out, you know, whether you're on the right track or not. You do have to have a, an innate understanding of the core problems that you're trying to solve. But, you know, a lot of product people, a lot of uh, founders have this, right? They have an idea as to what sort of problem area. They're often coming from this problem area. And so they do dream up solutions. The key thing is just to check them and make sure that it does, in fact, solve the right problem in the way that you hope it does. Yeah. What if you're not familiar with the problem that you're trying to solve, but you think it's a good opportunity? Well, that's actually potentially more powerful. If you don't understand the problem area, then you're going to be the type of person to ask more questions. You know, we screwed this up when we first started building Broadpad because I was a product manager. My co-founder was a product manager, and we initially just sort of put together tools that was going to help us do our own jobs, leading product in our own teams. And so we built for ourselves. And what we had at the end of it was the, the first versions of Broadpad. I call it, it wasn't even beta. This is alpha. And it was suitable for use in two companies, right? We hadn't actually stepped outside to go talk to other product managers to find out how they work. And so a lot of our assumptions ended up getting bashed apart. And I had to rewrite months of code. So this is something that was solving my problem, but turns out that didn't translate as well as I thought to the wider problem. So one of the first things I learned was that you are not your market. Even if you are your market, you are not your market, right? Because as soon as you step outside that, you're on the solution side and it's your job to go out to the people who are still actively having those problems and make sure that there's enough of them having that type of problem that you can actually solve for. I would like you 
to help us understand that also directly from your experience, how can you stay with the problem rather than with your solution as much as possible? Because you mentioned before, like you are not your market. So how do you keep that type of mindset? How do you make it concrete? So ProdPad is a tool that we've built for product managers. So we were product managers ourselves and needed tools to do our own jobs, like being able to make roadmaps to show off to the rest of the team and, uh, you know, gather in the ideas and feedback and figure out which things actually deserved to get built and which ones didn't so we could actually build impactful products. So ProdPad is a tool that does that for you, right? It connects to your OKRs and it connects to your feedback sources, uses some AI in there now, and basically helps product managers make more informed, better decisions. Now, as I said, you know, we went into this thing realizing that or thinking that, you know, we could build a tool for product people. We are product people. And we very quickly learned that we are not our market, right? We, 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 we had to get out there and start talking to other people. And that was the real thing. That was the, the turning point for it was actually getting in front of real users. We started releasing something that was just like a basic beta version of it. And I was on the new users in their inboxes all the time, just getting feedback, figuring out, you know, why they came across it, what they thought of it, how they were using it, looking through user logs to figure out what kind of things were working and not working. And actually it was by putting solutions in front of them and then asking those questions that we were able to figure out which parts of the product resonated really well and which parts had to be rewritten. Yeah, this, I think this is very powerful. What do you think is the best way to gather those type of feedback? Uh, like if you have like a sort of MVP that kind of works, kind of doesn't, but depends on the MVP. What do you think is the best way to gather user feedback? Uh, yeah, I mean, the real answer to that is that it depends, right? It depends on where your users are. And you're probably going to have to gather it from more than one place because your users aren't going to just funnel into one spot to give you feedback, right? The most powerful way is to get their feedback as they're using it. Right. So one of the things we built into ProdPad was a customer feedback widget that you can add to your product so people can add their feedback as they're going. But the reality is, is that there's going to be people, people who email you. Some of this stuff is going to come in as bug reports, but it wasn't actually a bug. It was just how they didn't understand using it. Some of it's going to come in from replies to your onboarding messages. Some of it's going to come in from real life conversations or you know, Zoom calls that you have when you are gathering feedback on some other piece of the product. So you've got to be ready to collect feedback wherever it happens and then ideally funnel it all into one place so you have a a body of feedback. You know, all the things people have told you about your product so that you can mine that to get information to figure out, okay, well, which of these things are interesting insights that signal what we should work on or not? And at that point, so let's say that you have noise signals from users that you have like gather feedbacks. you need to start prioritizing somewhat. Yeah. So how do you approach uh, the problem of uh, prioritizing and focusing on something as opposed to something else, uh, the trade-off? Yeah, I mean, your job as a product person isn't to just go build what your customers ask for. If you were to just go build what your customers ask for, you'd end up with a completely different type of product, most likely. You know, if we've just built what customers ask for, we would have built a different, better Jira. And it probably would have been a dead end because it was a crowded market, right? It's a tough space and everyone's tried to do that. We had to make sure that what we were doing was aligned with our vision of what we were trying to do. So we're trying to help teams make more informed product decisions, help teams build better products, not just improve their bug tracking flow, right? But also it had to line up with our overarching goals, right? To reach, um, you know, a particular level of market share and uh, grow our users and to um, impact our revenue goals. So these overarching goals, whether you call them OKRs or whatever, I like OKRs, these should be the things that drive your prioritization. You shouldn't be prioritizing based on solutions customers come up with, but you should be prioritizing on back to the problems, right? What problems are you trying to solve or that you, you could solve? What opportunities are on the horizon for you? Figure out what those are and in what order you want to tackle them. You know, if you were to do it this way in one particular order, would that get you in a particular place at the end of that? If you were to go over those, I like to think of them as stepping stones. If you were to go over those stepping stones in a different direction, it might take you in a different direction, different way, and you might achieve different goals. And 
really that feedback is there not to drive what you do. I don't like being customer driven. I hate that concept. Just like I don't like being data driven. I like being customer informed, data informed. And really, I want to be outcome driven. I want to be able to say, here are the outcomes I want to see for my business. So what do I need to do to get there? And that feedback should help support or not support it, right? You're supposed to look at that and say, oh, well, this one is a really well supported direction we could go in and it's going to help us hit, hit this um, outcome. And we have the insights from our customers here to help back that up. But sometimes you've got to be able to throw out what customers say. You know, I mean, we, we have this longstanding joke about not, you know, if, if we were to have a timeline roadmap or a, a nickel every time somebody gave us, timeline, gave us a request for a timeline roadmap, we'd be rich by now, but that wasn't part of our direction, our goal, our reason for being as a company. And so we stuck with the now, next, later format, which became hugely popular. So you can't just go based on number of things that people have asked for, how many people have asked for a particular feature. You've got to look at that in terms of the bigger picture, what you're trying to be, what you're trying to reach as a company, and you know, really what direction that means you're going to take. I'm Super fascinated by that because I was having conversation with other founders uh, that ended up pivoting on on ideas because uh, even though they had like a functioning product and they had users in this product, the feedback that we were receiving led them to modify the product so much uh, that they didn't feel it anymore. Like it was something mm -hmm. completely different uh, from the, f the yeah. vision that made them start the company in the first place. Which could be a good thing. You know, it could be that your customers, if you've got enough of them telling you to go a particular direction, maybe that vision isn't going to come to light, right? But what tends to happen is if you ask all your customers, that's a lot of different types of personas, right? Which of these are actually your ideal customer profile? And if you don't know, then chances are you're just going to listen to all that feedback kind of equally. And you might say, oh, there's a pile of people who want us to be this and a pile of people who want us to do that. And some people over here want us to do this thing over here. And if you were to build all of those things, you'd end up with a Frankenstein of a product, which is, you know, part this, part that, kind of going that direction, but not, not, not good in any one predict direction. You're not great at anything. And so you have this Frankenstein of a product. So what you really need to do is make sure that you're understanding um, what it is that you're trying to be and who it is you're trying to build for and take their feedback on board. Right, You should be able to tell from early days as to who that product is resonating for the most and sense check that. Like, is this who we want to build for? Is this type of problem we want to solve? And if so, then really double down on that feedback and understand how you can solve their problems more and more convincingly better than any other way that they're doing it already. But don't take on all your feedback and just sort of say, yeah, it turns out we need to build a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of the other. Can you make maybe a concrete example on the experience of building ProdPod? First of all, how did you figure out your ideal customer profile? Because like product managers, okay, but product managers, you know, several types, <laughs> different type of experiences. Like, did you farther, like, went, you know, a few levels down and really, you know, create like subcategories, let's say. And once you have that, what did you do with those, the feedback that came from your ICP versus the feedback that came, you know, from the larger, the larger audience? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, our ICP has evolved over time, partially because we've become more mature as a company and started identifying it better, but also because the product management space has grown up a lot in that time that we were there. You know, when we first started building ProdPad, there weren't really big product teams, right? Product managers were most often lone wolves. And so it was for, originally we thought it was going to be for, you know, individual product managers for them to bring in the rest of their team, you know, to get them up to speed with what's on the roadmap and where their idea has been and that sort of thing. Over time, we've realized that there's a bigger opportunity because product management teams have grown and they've got interesting problems, not just around communicating product management to the rest of the team, but making sure that, that product management is happening well within the team so that there's consistency in processes and people are you know, uh, aligned with what it is that they're supposed to do. And so ProdPad solves their problems even more convincingly than just for the individual product manager who, you know, you've got certain problems there, but you don't have the problem of trying to communicate it across, you know, 10 different product managers or sometimes 100 different product managers. So the, your ICP can e evolve, but 
We've also made sure that we're building something that is most convincing for teams on digital product ends. We do have a handful of companies who are building in the manufacturing space or other areas like that. But where we've really focused and said, this is the bread and butter, it's the companies who are building digital products. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a digital first company. And as a matter of fact, we've realized that there's a great market in companies who are not digital first, but have product managers building digital parts of their product. So companies going through their digital transformation, for example, is a great example of that. And then when you start realizing that there's feedback coming in from people who don't sit within your ICP, well, you've got to take what they say with a bigger grain of salt than what you hear from other customers, right? Because you're not going to be able to solve a problem for every type of company out there, for every vertical, for every level, whether they're, you know, brand new junior PMs versus senior people versus whatever else, right? So we've really honed that to align with what our product is best at and what's going to provide us with the best opportunities in the market. Yeah, absolutely. This is very, very interesting. And I think it's also interesting to mention that you kind of became uh, known in the product management space because of uh, the now next later roadmap. Yeah. And we kind of teased already, you know, before during the interview about this. But I wonder if you maybe could talk more about this and how, for example, it differs from traditional timeline type of roadmap, which, by the way, honestly, I always hated roadmaps. <laughs> like, like yeah, that's I why that. I appreciated <laughs> your method so much more like i had every time that yeah. if i had a nickel for every time that a stakeholder asked me oh what's show me your roadmap can i have a roadmap i was like oh god <laughs> yeah exactly that and that's the thing there's been a real big backlash against these timeline roadmaps these date driven feature driven roadmaps and i have something to admit the first version of prodpad was a timeline roadmap Right. Why was that? Because that's how I used to work. Right. My boss would ask me for a roadmap and, you know, you look around, go on Google and do an image search result for product roadmap and you still see timelines. Back then it was only timelines. And so, you know, who can blame a, a junior or a young product manager for going with a timeline roadmap and then just carrying on with that? Now, the thing is, is I used to make this roadmap wherever I was in my career, I'd make this roadmap. And then I'd do my best to try to deliver all these promises. And I was never able to deliver everything. And I thought that was me as a delivery person, right? I was like, oh, maybe it's just I need better project management skills. I need to get better at estimating and doing buffers and that sort of thing. But you'd see the same age-old problem happen with the roadmap in that when you estimate something, you might, you might say, oh, this is going to take a week, so it sits here on the roadmap. And you got something else and you say, oh, that's going to take two weeks, so it's going to sit here on the roadmap. But the reality is, is that teams don't want to be caught uh, missing their deadlines. And so team members give longer due dates. They give bigger buffers for their work. So a developer who says, ah, this will take two days. You say, okay, I'll make sure to put three or four days in the, in the thing. That's basically a week, right? Just to be on the safe side. And then the next one starts and that, 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 that one week thing from last time turned into a two week thing this time. And so you end up with this roadmap that gets longer and longer, especially because if you continue to miss those dates, you had a ton of buffer, but you ever heard of Parkinson's law? Parkinson's law is the one that says work expands to give the time that you've uh, to, to fill the time given to it, right? So if you say it's going to take two weeks to do something, even though you were told it was going to take a week, it'll take two weeks because scope always creeps and procrastination happens, right? And so if you make a roadmap saying, oh, well, this stuff is all going to happen like this, guarantee you, you're going to miss some of those dates. And what then happens is people go, oh, we miss, missed the dates. We better add more buffer. And so what the, what the engineer would have said was two days. They actually say, eh, let's call it four. And so you take that four and you turn it into something longer. And it just becomes longer and longer and longer. This is why there are teams who are, you know, they've got dozens of developers and product people and whatever, hundreds sometimes, and they can't deliver as fast as a team of like three people just cracking on and solving stuff because that team of three people isn't being held accountable to some dates that they made up to pr prove to their boss that they could do so. 
But it was only when we codified this, we put it in Prodpad, because, you know, handling, managing a timeline roadmap before there were any roadmap tools was a pain in the butt. So I thought, problem to solve, I'm going to digitize this. And worked with my co-founder to, 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 to build this thing out using duct tape and jQuery and Bootstrap. This is back in the days when you could do that. And we got it in front of customers. And these are very early, early testers, right? These weren't paid customers. These were product people from our circle. And people started coming back with feedback on this roadmap. They loved the idea of being able to take their ideas and drag and drop them onto the roadmap and make them bigger and smaller and get an export of the roadmap. Cool, we solved that problem. But feedback started coming back. And about, it was about a month after we put this in front of people, people started saying, hey, I want to be able to like multi-select and drag and drop stuff over. I want to move everything over on the roadmap. You could pick things up one by one and drag and drop, but you couldn't move everything all at the same time. Now, had I just built what my customers wanted, I would have had like a multi-select thing or you know something that allowed you to shift all, everything over by a month or something. But that was a pain to build. Right, we'd have been diving deeper into code, but also it felt a little bit weird going, wait, I thought it was just me who couldn't deliver. Turns out no one was delivering the roadmap, even product people that I truly respected and thought were doing a great job. They weren't delivering their roadmaps that they had built. So why was that? And basically I asked the five whys, I dove right in to figure out what was going on. And turns out no one is building the roadmap and roadmaps are made up of lies and disappointment, right? People are just putting stuff on there because it placates the boss. The boss gives them a little pat in the head and tells them to go build it. And, you know, people are just stuck with this failure down the line when they haven't been able to deliver stuff. And so we started figuring out what people would do instead or how people think about things. And the most important thing is not whether the delivery date is set for mid-April or not. It's whether you're working on it first or second, right? How confident are you that this is the right thing to work on, the right pri problem to prioritize? And the other thing is that we wanted to depart from having feature level stuff, right? Timeline roadmaps kind of lead people to put individual features and their due dates on there. And instead, being able to take that step backwards and say, no, what are the problems you're trying to solve and in what order? Now, let's build from there. And so that's how the Now Next Later was, was, was born. Myself and Simon, my co-founder. We sat down in a cafe in Wandsworth, which is basically equidistant from where we were, 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 were living at that point in time. We were both working from home, so we'd meet up at a cafe. And he wrote the first version of the, the three-column concept on a napkin, which I wish we'd kept. But basically, we looked at this and said, okay, well, this might work. Should we code it in? And so throughout the timeline roadmap code, dropped in these three basic columns and put it in front of people. And because it was still on a page that said roadmap, we weren't sure whether we could still call it a roadmap. Like, is it a roadmap? It doesn't look like a roadmap, but we've already sort of, you know, coded it in as a roadmap page and that sort of thing. So we'll just leave it as is and see what people think. And people loved it, right? This is one of our first points where we realized, ah, right, there's something happening here. People are taking advantage of this. We're seeing some growth because people loved the idea of being able to use a now, next, later roadmap being able to say, here's what I'm working on in the current term, here's what's happening later on, and be able to m map things out that way, but still have it presented the same way you would a roadmap. I absolutely love this. I 100% uh, agree with you on your analysis. I think it's like absolutely spot on. I think roadmap are a useful thinking exercise to kind of help you organize the, the job. But the problem is that people really get hung up on the roadmap uh, and like they start to hold you accountable to it. Furthermore, as you mentioned, it was very much like single feature driven as opposed to thinking about the mm -hmm. bigger picture and what to prioritize. I kind of like think of it uh, as like an attempt of fitting project management into product management. Uh, which is, you know, actually two exactly different that. things. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's contentious because people see the roadmap as a thing that the product managers do. What does the product manager do? Oh, it makes the roadmap. Okay. But the product manager often doesn't actually decide what that roadmap looks like. A lot of those decisions are made based on, you know, the, 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 the execs in the team saying this has to be done by this date and this is what you're going to go build or marketing dictating or sales dictating what's going on there. 
And so product managers actually get kind of a bad rap because they build this roadmap and then they're not able to deliver it on time because ultimately they're forced to give estimates that were never reasonable in the first place. And the roadmap doesn't account for things that may or may not happen. And the world is so changeable. So no one finishes the roadmap. And it makes the product manager look bad, even though oftentimes the stuff that's going on there isn't driven by the product team. It also very much reflects on the conception and the definition of you have, that you have of the role of the product manager. As you said, is the product manager responsible for the delivery and therefore kind of the roadmap? Or is the product manager responsible for driving revenues or, uh, or user it, growth? Right. All what? right. It depends, right? So put it this way. Ideally, you'd say, yeah, our product manager is, is here to drive outcomes, right? On our outcomes, we want to get more users and you know, grow our revenues and all these other things. Great. But you've got to empower your product manager and you've got to keep them out of the weeds. Too many product managers, I mean, back when I was a product manager, I was also in charge of delivery, right? So you got to think about it this way. If you're a product person or if you've got a product person, think about which hats they're wearing. They might be given the title of product manager, but if you're having them do the project management delivery work, that's going to take up some of their brain space. And it's actually a, a, an alternating hat that they've got to wear, right? I like to think of it as like the devil and the angel on your shoulder giving you advice. And you've got to think like, okay, am I listening to this one or this one? The product manager is going to say, you know, hey, while we're looking at this particular area, let's dive in and do some discovery and take into account this feedback here and actually make sense to build this at the same time because, you know, we're in there, we're solving this type of area and that's all sort of one problem area. And the, 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 the project manager on the other shoulder is basically saying, no, that's scope creep. We said we were going to have this done. Don't do anything else besides what has been you know, sold to the client or you know, agreed to whatever. And you, you don't have the ability to go in there and think wider about the problem. So ideally, product managers spend more of their time in that more strategic place and discovery-led place where they're able to ask the questions and look at the bigger picture and help drive direction for the, the, the product. But they've got to admit that sometimes because the company isn't big enough or because they're understaffed or because of many different reasons, because no one else will do it often, they're in charge of delivery too. And that they've just got to remember which hat they're wearing and why they're making decisions to, to solve problems. How would you allocate the time? Like if, you, if you're if you tasked to do like a little bit of everything. So most people by default end up spending the, their time on the delivery camp. I actually kind of have a strong, strong allergic reaction to that. That's mm -hmm. my personal take. I think that there are perhaps better people qualified to lead the delivery camp, namely software developers themselves, or at least their engineering lead, because they are building the products. They are the one that are actually doing the code on a daily basis. And I really think that the product manager should be responsible uh, to drive the metric that they say that they are going to move uh, with their feature. But that's not often uh, possible. Not every company see these or yeah. think like that. So how, how would you allocate the, the time split? Yeah. So, I mean, it depends, right? There's a few different ways you might uh, tackle this. Like if you're in a company that, you know, all you have are some developers who are sitting here waiting for you to tell them what to build and, you know, what releases to stack it up in and you've got to break it down into user stories for them. You basically got to spoon feed these developers. You're going to spend a lot of time doing that and it has to be done. Um, but it means that overall things are just going to move slowly, slower, right? You're not able to do as much because you're doing two people's jobs right? That could be somebody else's job. That could be a product owner or that could be a developer on the team or a scrum master or any number of different roles that could help take some of that weight off depending on, you know, what type, what shape of company you're in so that you can be spending more time in that discovery phase, figuring out, you know, who should we be talking to and what are they telling us? And, you know, are we on the right track and what should we be building next? So if you find yourself in a position where you're, you're handling both there, You've got to advocate for yourself. You've got to advocate for the role of product management and why you can help with that and what needs to give if you're going to do that. So it might be making sure that the execs know the difference between product and the project side, making sure that they know that you would love to see a resource in there so that you can focus on this versus that. And, you know, articulating what you're actually able to do based on the constraints you have. If you're only able to do, you know, a little bit, 
then that's what the company's willing to invest in. But they need to know that they're making that decision. And that decision means that they're not going to move as fast as their competitor who has two product people and a product owner or, you know, whatever else. So you've got to make that case. In reality, if you have few resources and, you know, the, the budgets are tight, things just go slower and the company has to understand that. And that's, that's sometimes okay, right? Sometimes it, it doesn't pay to burn cash that you don't have. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to shift gear a little bit, if that's all right with you, because you are also behind one of the most popular and largest product management communities and conferences worldwide, which is called Mind the Product. And I am a true and firm believer that communities are going to be the single biggest currency that we are going to have in a world that will be increasingly dominated by AI. Mm -hmm. So first of all, how did the idea came about of Mind the Product? And what strategies uh, did you use uh, to build a community like Mind the Product? Yeah, really great question. So Mind the Product came about not because we knew everything about product and wanted to go tell people. It's because we didn't know and we wanted to learn from people, right? And so it started off as myself and Simon, who's my founder of ProdPad as well. This is actually how I met him. I met a fellow product person and I said, ah, Right. Rarely see other product people. Right. I mean, I've been going to, you know, the, it was at a meetup event for 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 social media people. And I'd been to we're comparing notes. We've been to no, uh, meet, meetups for entrepreneurs. We'd been to meetups for marketers. We'd been to meetups for developers. We'd been to meetups for social media, you know, trying to find our people. And the, you never found other product people at these things. Right. You never met other product people back at this time because you were a lone product person in the in your own in the company and you were outnumbered by devs and marketing and sales and everybody else. And so I met this other product manager and I was like, oh, well, you know, I've been thinking about building a, a community called Product Camp, Product Camp London. Product Camp started off in the States with Rich Marinoff kicking it off uh, first. And it's got some history before that. But I'd been looking up how to start a product camp in our city. And I met this fellow product manager and I was like, hey, you know, this, this, this could be fun. You know, do you want to get involved with it? And he did. And so we started planning this thing. And then it wasn't long afterwards that somebody introduced us to Martin Erickson, who had just kicked off plans for the first ever product tank. And so we ended up joining forces, right? We ended up working together on the whole thing. And that became Mind the Product. And one of the really key things to the success was the consistency, right? So every month there was a product tank. Every year there was a product camp. And we just kept turning up and making it happen. Every month there would be more and more people trying to get in. You know, we, we, we outgrew venues every few months and our wait list got longer and longer and longer. And once you have a wait list of several hundred people trying to get into a meetup that can only hold 200 people, you're like, oh, maybe there's something here. Could we run a conference? And that was when we started planning for the Mind the Product Conference, which is the one that people know, you know, the world's largest series of conferences for product people. At its height, we were in London, San Francisco, Singapore, Hamburg, and Manchester, and with plans to do more. And really, the reason why we were able to sell out tickets was because we had a community. We had this constant beat of the drum. And, you know, it took years to get to that point, but it, it paid off in spades in the long run. So I'm very curious, uh, what's a good engagement strategy and sustainable strategy for a community, in your opinion? I mean, I see community members as not much different than your end users of your product, right? They are people who can provide useful feedback. They can provide insight into whether the direction you're going is the right way. but just like you don't want to be customer driven, you want to be customer informed. You want to be informed by your audience, but not overridden by them. Because ultimately, you know, a lot of these people building communities, whether they realize it or not, what they're building is an organization. It's uh, it's uh, whether they've formed it as a company, it's basically on its way to be one that um, you need to think about, you know, how are we going to make sure that this is monetized in a way that can pay us to do or put our time into it? How can we make this so that it's a sustainable community that can grow beyond, you know, the one city or the one topic or the one whatever we've got going on? And so you do that by 
be taking, taking a look at what it is you're trying to do. What is your vision? What are you trying to achieve with this? And making sure that you've got a clear idea as to what that is. And then pulling in feedback from your community to make sure that you are in going in the right direction, that it is something that resonates with them. But you don't want to be overridden by your community. You can't just do everything that everybody in the community says because that's not a community. That's, that's chaos. What you want to do is curate, really. You want to curate the, the, the best uh, events for them, the best topics for them, the best of everything you're seeing from these community members. And that also means, you know, when it comes to features that you build into your community platform or whatever you're doing, you've got to build it in based on feedback, but not driven by it, right? You've got to understand which of these things are going to help you solve the problems for the, the, the org or the company or the community itself, not the individual community members. A bit maybe of a side tangent to this topic of building yeah. communities and, and mind the product. Because I, I read that you mentioned that you suffer from stage fright uh, and then somehow <laughs> you were able to overcome these. Uh, and like, I literally don't see it like, like at all. And I, and I also watch you, you know, on YouTube, uh, giving public presentations at conferences in front yeah. of thousands of people. So it's really not obvious that you suffer from stage fright. Uh, and I wonder, how did you overcame yours? Yeah, I mean, it was a lot worse way back when. I think the real key is just repetition, right? I put myself in front of an audience, you know, in some way, shape or form at, at monthly for coming on 15 years now. And so, you know, I remember one of my very first product camps. This is the second product camp, about a year after we started them. And I had to go in front of the audience, which was bigger than I'd seen before, right? This is 200 people. And they were all looking to me to just open up the room, welcome them in, tell them what the day was going to be made up of. And I had the notes in my head, but instantly I forgot all the notes. And I just sort of stumbled over my words. And at one point in time, about two minutes into the intro, I just said, I'm just going to start over. <laughs> and I took a deep breath and I did. And it was like, this is fine, right? No one criticized me. Most people, I don't, I don't think anybody would even remember it. Right. But I remember my voice shaking and, you know, losing my, my thread entirely. And I, you know, it was fine. Uh, I've since learned to recover better than that. Right. I don't have to just blank and start over. But, you know, the reality is that when you're in front of an audience, they're there cheering for you. Right. They're hoping you're doing a good job. They're hoping you to, you know, they're cheering you on to, 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 to communicate what it is you're trying to do and, you know, move things on smoothly. And so if things don't go smoothly, just take a deep breath, look for the person in the audience who's smiling and nodding, you know, take a peek at your notes, say, hey, you know what, I've, I've missed a point, let me go back here, or, you know, whatever has happened, just talk it off, walk it off, breathe it off, and just get back in there. There's nothing to, to sweat or worry about. One of the things I love doing is whenever I go out into, or whenever I'm about to do a, a talk or a conference, I try to make sure that I've gone up on the stage beforehand and looked up towards where the audience is. And sometimes it's just a room of like 100 chairs. And sometimes it's a whole sweep of like, whoa, this auditorium has three levels. Okay, good to know. But once you've actually seen it there, you can picture the people and you can start, you know, walking around the stage and getting a sense of who, you, you know, where you are and what it's going to be like. And you can practice your opening lines. I always try to get access to the place before I go up. So I've got this level of comfort. So when I do walk out, I know what the lay of the land is. And then the other thing you do is you find the people in the audience shortly after you start your, your talk, look for the people who are smiling and nodding, right? The ones who are really into it, right? There's going to be people who are on their phones, not paying attention. There's going to be people who are just taking notes and don't look engaged, but maybe are listening. But look for the ones who are smiling and nodding and you know getting your jokes and that sort of thing. And then just do your talk to them, right? So you do a little bit over this to the over there to this person, and then you go talk to that person over there, and then you go talk to that person over there. So you always look like you're scanning the audience, but you're actually finding your friends. And they may be plants, they may be friends that you have. Oftentimes I have people who are on the same circuit as me and are in the the audience and they're having a great time. They're they're smiling and nodding. Other times it's complete strangers who they're just jiving with your talk. And so work with it, right? And, you know, make them part of the experience so that, you know, they're having a good time, you're having a good time, and you can just relax up there. I think this is absolutely brilliant advice. 
I wonder, aside from stage fright, are there any challenges or also like mistakes that you made and that you wish you would have done differently while either building Mind the Product or even ProdPad? Right. I mean, tons. You know, I always, I've always said, like, if I had 2020, uh, you know, hindsight, if I, could, if I could go back in time and redo the whole thing, but with the knowledge I have today, I could have done both of those twice as fast, right? Because there were so many little set batches, things that you didn't realize that, oh, that was actually, you know, screaming out to me as the opportunity to go after. And you only went after it, you know, several months later or several years later. And so, you know, one of the things I've realized is as you get bigger, your mess ups get bigger as well. And so you've got to realize that, right? Like the, you know, the first things that we did in ProdPad, we built, you know, a bunch of, bunch of code, but it was just me and my co-founder and we hadn't quit our day jobs at this point in time. So what was lost besides some time that we, you know, spent in our twenties hacking away on things, eh, not a huge loss. Nowadays, you know, if, if I have a product direction and I send my team off to go build something for several months and it doesn't work. I mean, that's costly. That's, you know, how many people in the team and how much time and, you know, how much have I got to damage control in terms of telling people what we built and then taking it away from them and making sure that it's rolled back properly. So the risks get higher. And so you've got to get better at uh, first setting clear direction as to what it is you're trying to do and making sure people know how to de-risk things. So Making sure that whenever you are going off to build something, you're not just hacking away and building it like myself and Simon did early days. You're actually spending time doing discovery up front. You're doing your prototyping. You're iterating on those designs before you start spending time in costly development cycles. So, yeah, there's been a lot of things that we've you know put out there and you know didn't work and had to quietly roll back. There's been lots of things that go wrong with in the conference world. But the, the reality is, is that you can minimize these by making sure the team has a discovery and experimentation mindset and doesn't put everything at risk trying to go for something big. I wonder, how do you train your thinking to minimize those downsides? Because uh, you're right, when you start to grow and you get some traction, then mistakes becomes, become overall more costly. And I really like, uh -huh. you know, like Jeff Bezos letters to investor type one yeah. of decision versus type two decision making. And I see it uh, like as a useful uh, way to kind of train your thinking around that. So I wonder, aside from, if anything, aside from like more time spends on discovery and experimentation, are there any other useful thinking models that you refer to to minimize those downsides? Yeah, I mean, it, it's really about how your team thinks about these things. And I like to use, you know, tweaks in language to get the team thinking about how they are, you know, why they're doing work and how they're going to do work. So this is where questions like, what problem does this solve comes from, right? If you are, you know, let's say I come up with some harebrained idea and, you know, mention it to the, 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 the Broadpad team, they're trained. They know we've been doing this for years. They'll say, well, what problem does that solve? And if I can't answer that, then that's the first hurdle, right? Or somebody else comes up with something saying, yeah, we should definitely do this because the competitor did it. Cool. What problem does that solve? Right? Let's, let's figure this out. And if they can answer it, then it's, it takes us down into the next level where you start saying, okay, well, you know, how is it going to solve that? And what's the value of solving that? But also using terms like I bet or how might we, right? I like the term I bet because it, it, it takes the pressure off you being right, right? Like as a product person or as a founder, you're going to be wrong a lot. And so you need to come up with multiple things, multiple strands to go test. And so you're not saying, you know, I think we should do this because X. You're, you're not asserting, you're supposing, you're saying, I bet we could do this and this is going to have this sort of impact. And your bet might be wrong and that's totally fine. You're free to take the next bet. So it really gets the team thinking about the experimentation mindset. I love this. And the thing about the language and how you rephrase things, I think it's so powerful and so underrated and costs you absolutely nothing. Absolutely. Yeah. And it builds psychological safety in the team, right? So by psychological safety, it's around, you know, does the team feel comfortable speaking up when something is not right? Do they admit their own errors so that, you know, them and others can jump in there and help out? You know, are they, they actively getting involved with, you know, the, the product direction that you've given? Or are they tuned out? Are they, 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 they're not paying any attention there? They're sort of just 
doing what they're told and they don't feel like they can say anything about your direction or anybody else's direction because it, you know it might cause cause grief and you really want a team who's got that psychological safety who can you know call bs if something isn't right and speak up if things are failing and that puts you and the rest of the team in a place that you can start adjusting from there how do you foster i wonder this type of safe environment especially in companies that are already formed like it's not a startup so i think it's kind of easier to establish this in a startup and again like we can dive deeper in how to but also it's interesting to i think dive deeper into what do you do if you join a company that maybe doesn't have you know perfectly psychological safety in place uh, but you want to contribute to move into that direction yeah i mean one of the things that you can do i mean i i talk to product people all the time who run into these environments and one of the things that you can do is to start building it from the inside out, right? So as the product person, you've got control over whether things are framed as we're going to do this because I say so, or because the boss says so, and I'm just going to, you know, follow his orders. Or are you doing it in terms of saying that, you know, here are the problems you're trying to solve. Get people involved with this, right? Make it part of your usual meetings and conversations and the way that you work, where you talk about, hey, these are the problems that we think we might want to solve. Are these the right problems? If I missed anything, opening yourself up for a debate, right? Opening yourself up for your own decisions up for a discussion where you can say, hey, I think this is the right direction, but I could be wrong. Tell me where I'm wrong. And you start gathering this input from people. Um, using terms like I bet and how might we uh, it sort of um, brings people along for the ride and leaves space for things to say, well, you know, if you bet this, then I bet this. Cool. Let's see which one does the best job. We can, we can figure out which one we want to test and then go from there. So you're creating space within your own area. And product's really great because it's so central, right? It impacts and you know, pulls in insights from the marketing realm, the customer support, the, feed, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, design and tech side from the business side as well. So you've got all these insights coming into one place. And so this can be sort of the nugget of where you start building out that psychological safety for your immediate team and helping people get used to the language they use to 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 build that wider. Dana, we are approaching the end of the interview. Maybe if you want to leave listeners with a thought or a request and maybe a place where they can find you and follow you if they want to. Yeah, absolutely. So People can find me on LinkedIn. I'm the only Jana Basto there, so I'm really easy to connect to. If you do connect with me, drop me a note and remind me where you heard me, and that way I can connect those dots. And I know a lot of people are trying to make that transition from the timeline roadmap to the now, next, later roadmap. We've actually written a guide, started off as a series of blogs that I wrote. We've written this guide that helps talk you through why you want to switch and how to get your team on board. And specifically down to how to convince tricky stakeholders like that, you know, exec or that investor who really wants timeline roadmaps and is struggling to explain why, or your marketing team or your sales team or even to your customers. So we've got that as well as a, a presentation that you can use to use internally to convince people to get on board with it. So I'll drop you those links and that way everyone else can get access to them. But in the meantime, connect with me and we'll have a chat. Absolutely. And we will leave all the links in the show notes and in the YouTube uh, video description. Dana, Great. thank you so much for being here and for answering uh, all my questions. Of course. Hey, thank you so much for having me. This has been great. And for listeners, I'll see you in the next episode. Bye. That's all from today's episode. Thank you so much for watching or listening. If you find this episode valuable, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel or to the Polyweb podcast on Spotify, Apple, or your favorite podcast app. It would be fantastic if you could leave us a rating, a review, or a comment, as this really helps other listeners find the show. All the resources mentioned in this episode will be linked in the description and in the show notes. See you on the next episode. And if you cannot wait until next week, you can watch this episode right here that relates to some of the things that we talk about in this episode. Bye.